Okay, I'll just do that. So we can wait another 10 minutes for people to join in before we start. In this file, I would also request you all to please uh, take out the copy of the comparative chart and the criminal law amendment bill that has been handed over to you. We'll be waiting for another five minutes. Right now, we have about 37 people. So once it uh, crosses about 50, we'll start. I hope that's OK. As I've been told by the organizers at the end, um, in the last 20 minutes, I'll be taking all the questions that people have. So I guess, yeah, we've crossed 50, so we can start now. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for taking out time in the morning to join me on this session. Today, we will be discussing the criminal law amendment bill, which has been introduced in the Rajya Sabha in 2019 uh, by Member of Parliament, Mr. KTS Tulsi. And we'll dial it back and understand why an intervention is required today for gender neutral sexual laws or for sexual offenses. Um, so the first thing that I would like you all to go through is please take out uh, the copy of the comparative chart that has been emailed to you. And if somebody doesn't have it, uh, you can just follow along. It's, it's very simple to understand. The chronology that actually goes is that Back in 2000, in, in actually the year 2000, uh, the Law Commission of India came out with what is the 172nd Law Commission report, in which they, after extensive study, found that there is actually a need for uh, gender neutral laws for sexual offenses. And this was proposed way back in 2000 um, through this report. And this report also spoke about that how when it comes to sexual offenses, um, especially in children, boys are at a greater risk and young boys are the ones who are raped far more than girls. 
and it is this law report of the law commission that resulted in what we have is the uh, poxo act of 2012 the prevention of children from sexual offences as you all may know it stems from the 172nd law commission report so from the period of 2000 till 2012 there was no amendment that took place in the criminal laws with regard to 375 but now we come to the year to 2012 in 2012 it is in this in nearly but 4th or 5th december 2012 it is the government itself which introduced a bill in the rajya sabha to make rape laws gender neutral so by that logic what the amendment the 2012 amendment proposed was that the word rape would be replaced by sexual assault and the both the victim and the perpetrator the physiology would become gender neutral in that case and it was introduced near the 4th or the 5th december but immediately thereafter is when the nirbhaya gang rape took place and that is something that nobody needs introduction on then the repercussion that it had on our entire system how the entire country was outraged when such a heinous crime was taken place so when that happened of course the justice varma committee was constituted on the 23rd of december and within one month they came up with what is the justice varma committee commission report that is in on 23rd january 20 uh, 2012 uh, 2013 sorry is when the report came out and in so far as 375 is concerned the report said that we can actually make rape laws gender neutral but only when it comes to the phraseology of the victim but the perpetrator is supposed to remain as per the report was supposed to remain as being a male so only a man is said to commit rape as per the justice varma committee uh, report and the victim can be any person so what before the implementation of the justice varma committee report through an amendment in our system there was an ordinance that was taken out because of course the parliament was not in session at that time so whatever changes that need to be done when the parliament is not in session is through an ordinance so when the ordinance came out at that time they they made rape laws gender neutral so for a, for a very brief period of 58 days with regard to both the perpetrator as well as the victim the rape laws in our country were gender neutral but that again led, led to such outrage by the media the activists um and people at large because everybody was of course worried about the safety of women in the country and how the rape um how the rape statistics in the country were constantly on the rise so this ordinance was repealed and that's when the amendment came in and we were restored to what is this position as we see today that um, only a man is said to be the perpetrator and only a female can be the victim as per the 2013 amendment of the criminal law amendment act now if you could please just scroll down in the comparative chart to see the definition as it stands of 375 right now in the comparative chart you would find it and it's a very interesting shift that you will understand so the definition of 375 as it stands today on the left hand side in the comparative chart is the definition as it stands today and the proposed amendment is on the right hand side so as it stands today is that a man is said to commit a rape so if he right so that clarifies the fact that only a man can be the perpetrator if he penetrates its penis to any extent into the vagina mouth urethra anus of a woman or makes her do so with him or any other person so that makes it clear that only a man can be the perpetrator and only a female can be the victim 
secondly it's part b inserts to any extent any object or a part of body not being the penis into the vagina or urethra or anus or of a woman or makes her do so with him or any other person c is manipulates any part of the body of a woman so as to cause penetration into the vagina urethra anus or of or of the body of any such woman or makes her do so with him or any other person and d is applies his mouth to the vagina so and so forth now before i explain what the changes are if you could also just simultaneously read the definition of 377 as we have it 377 is essentially when it says that a man any person is said to commit is said to engage in carnal intercourse against the order of nature with a man woman or animal so any person sorry is is punishable under 377 if they engage in carnal intercourse against the order of nature now interestingly there is no definition of what carnal intercourse is there is nothing that is found in the ipc to this extent now we've just read what 375 means as per the uh, definition in, under the ipc and if you could see that in the four parts that we read where it talks about the private part it uh, talks about applying using your penis using a, another object using your fingers using your mouth to any of the parts of a body of a woman that amounts to rape now when it comes to what carnal intercourse is because there is no such definition that is found in terms of the description of carnal intercourse it's only through precedents have we been able to understand so far that what exactly carnal intercourse intakes so far in our legislative system and that essentially means the same thing when there is any any sexual intercourse that takes place which is not for the purposes of recreation so anything in procreation uh, sorry anything that is not for the purposes of rec for procreation and when you are engaging in any intercourse for purposes other than procreating so that could be for recreation and in uh, instances where it is not in the traditional form of penile vaginal intercourse so that would include anything that is listed even in the definition of 375 bcd so applying your mouth applying any other object or using any third uh, using your fingers for manipulation that actually entails what carnal intercourse is so what we are trying to understand today is that why is there a difference when it comes to creation of 375 and 377 wherein in 375 you say that it's only a man who can be the perpetrator and only a victim only a female can be the victim whereas in 377 that's gender neutral so both the perpetrator and victim are gender neutral and this kind of discrimination in our in our understanding is violative of articles 14 and 21 for the fact that 377 is actually devoid of uh, the kind of victimology that 375 entails because there is it does not take 377 does not take into account the victimology is the psychological trauma and it does not even give you enough leverage to be termed as a victim so if in realistic terms if you read the case studies of people who've actually gone to register get their cases registered under 375 they end up booking both the persons the definition of 377 uh, of 377 i'm so sorry the definition of 377 as you may have it does not differentiate between the perpetrator and the victim so if any person is found to be booked under 377 both the persons within the act were being booked and for this fact now we can turn it around and understand how we came to decriminalizing 377 all these years without having to fully understand that 377 was never the homosexual law it applies to heterosexuals as well and 
we'll also explore into the fact that how many people have this uh, incorrect notion that 377 um, actually there is no proof when you book somebody in 377 um, in, in terms of when you book somebody and the trial comes in where will be where will the medical evidence come from if it's something apart from uh, using your genital organs and if it's manipulation of the mouth of any other object but there is something that people do not take into account that even if there is 375 uh, rape under 375 that has been con uh, that has been committed for sections b c d uh, for subsections b c d any offense that is committed of course by the mouth any other object or by your hands there is no evidence when it's for that as well. So let's look into the chronology before we study the bill further. So after 2013, uh, when this change took place, so we've actually shifted from penetration orifice because prior to this, 375 was, was only when any penetration was uh, un, un, uh, forceful penetration by a man to a woman uh, occurred only then that was rape but after that there was a shift from penal vaginal orifice to penetration orifice which meant that penetration in any form like we have just uh, read under the present definition of 375 that has been the shift so let us understand that once this took place in 2014 in the judgment of Nalsa versus Union of India, the Supreme Court held that transgender persons are were considered as the third gender, right? But the definition of transgender in our country still hasn't um, been evolved. So that it's still pending in the parliament, though the government has come out with the definition of what entails to be transgender persons in our country. But um, the transgender right activists, they do not fully agree with having such a limited scope of a definition. Uh, because insofar as our country recognizes transgender persons, it's only limited to eunuchs and hermaphrodites. So in 2014, transgender persons were termed as the third gender. Then we move on and we see that in 2017, in the landmark judgment of K.S. Putaswami versus Union of India, right to privacy was made a fundamental right under Article 21. And it is then under Article 21 that they also looked into... Um, Justice Deepak Mishra, in his judge part of his judgment, had also mentioned this very clearly that sexual orientation is also a fundamental right under Article 21. And that led to decriminalizing of 377 under um, in, in the case of Nafte Singh Johar versus Union of India, which we, we all are very well aware of. However, again, 377, the judgment of Navtej Singh Johar, it actually breaks down 377 into consensual carnal intercourse and non-consensual carnal intercourse. Now, if you read the actual judgment of, uh, sorry, if you read the actual definition of 377, there is absolutely no differentia between what is in, what is, um, uh, consensual 377 and what is non-consensual 377. It just says that a person who engages in carnal intercourse against the order of nature, and we've discussed what is the order of nature for procreation and penal vaginal orifice, right? So any person who engages in carnal intercourse against the order of nature with a man, woman, or an animal shall be punished for a period of minimum 10 years to life and in rape laws under 375 we have minimum seven years to life so again there is no no differentia when it comes to what is um, consensual and non-consensual in 377 and also there is no 
intelligible differentia as to why we have 7 to life in 375 and 10 to life in 377 when what actually constitutes carnal intercourse against the order of nature has already been covered in clauses B, C, D of 375. So having understood this entire chronology, um, through the society of Mr. KTS Tulsi, there was a PIL which was uh, which was instituted in the Supreme Court uh, through the Criminal Justice Society of India. And if you may please open the preamble of the bill, you will also see this chronology which is uh, given there in an abridged version. So when this... Uh, PIL came up for hearing in front of uh, Justice Gogoi. He, the only question that the bench had was that, how do we know that there is men are actually getting raped? Not having to, not, in, have, not having understood this fact that <coughs> we understand that under the till the age a um, boy doesn't turn eighteen, he's he is covered under POXO and we understand that a child can actually is, is vulnerable uh, to be raped. But suddenly, when you cross the age of 18, that protection under the law is taken away from you or for a transgender person. And their only contention of the bench of the Supreme Court was that, first of all, there have not been any reported incidents of men being raped and secondly how how exactly will we come out with evidence to even conduct trials for which we have to also understand that there cannot be statistics when it comes to rape in men till the time we don't allow that data to be collected because if today a man is raped and he goes to the police station under what section can the FIR actually take place? It's only after 377, the decriminalization in Naptet Singh Johar, that if you say that it was non-consensual, then still an FIR under 377 would take place. Right. But that does not even give you the sensitization and the victimology that 375 as a rape victim would give you. And the second aspect is then again, if if it only the problem is that where will we get the evidence to conduct the trial to see if a person has actually um, his body, his or her, her body has been raped, uh, has been violated under the realm of 377. If we say that there can't be medical evidence to prove that, then in the same way, the kind of manipulation that is there in 375 BCD, that is also devoid of any kind of medical evidence and it's one it's the word of one person against the other and if that alone is the only contention that we have that we won't be able to prove it in terms of a trial then perhaps in that way bcd of 375 also um, are are very very difficult in court to prove so one one while the hearing was going on he, uh, Justice Ranjan Gogoi, he understood that there was, of course, a gap in the law. So the order which came out by the Supreme Court was that uh, because the parliament has already, um, in the 172nd report, 